know Reggie Watts is? The of course. Musician? Um, I, I had had him on the show, and this was something that uh, I was trying to wrap my brain around. Is this, you know, he does these live uh, improvisational performances, and I, I kept asking him, um, "When are you going to put out a record? When are you going to put out a record?" And it's it's tough for me as somebody who's who's a writer who you know it's really important that the most number the, the largest number of people possible see anything I put out into the world. This idea of making something and having it be completely ethereal and just live in the moment is a little bit beyond me and that's that's part of the thing with with live theater at least that performance right if absolutely recording i mean it was very much what i i mean first of all i'm a theater guy i just i i didn't i'd never been to the theater but i in high school we did theater one day Mm -hmm. and i was just instantly wow what is this i love doing this I love being. I love making believe I'm somebody else. Yeah. So I found theater to be very relaxed, it'd be exciting, fun. It was a way to be around a lot of other people. Um, I love the magic of it. I love the fact that when you're in the audience, you know that what you're seeing is fake, and yet it's real at the same mm-hmm. time. I mean, one of the first Broadway things I ever saw was Frank Langella in Dracula, <laughs> and I mean, it was like Dracula was really on stage, and I was at the back of the balcony, and I felt like he was breathing down my throat. Um, but having said that, that was theater for me. That was like this big learning thing, and it ended up being what I ended up doing. But there was also the time I came out of, which was the 60s. And out of the 60s, in the 70s, there was a whole art world thing happening, which I only learned about because I ended up meeting some art people and hanging around with them over the years. But conceptual art and, and all these kinds of art forms, performance art, were all about the fact that artists didn't want to make some thing that yeah. they could then sell for two million. I mean, they changed their mind about that over the decades. <laughs> They're happy to sell stuff now. But at the time, the idea was that things come and go, and that's the way mm-hmm. life is. And so in a way, the performance is a model for the way things are in reality. Which you can definitely make. I remember I was in a I was in an amazing CD store mm-hmm. many years ago with this guy who collected the most incredible stuff that I'd never heard of, and I used to hang out. It was on Prince Street. Guy ended up becoming a big crackhead and lost the store and everything. But one day I was sitting in the store and I said, "This is you have an you have this is a you have an amazing amount of music here." He goes. He looked around the room and he said, "This this isn't music." This is recorded music. Mm. Music is when people get together and somebody plays or sings and other people are yeah. there at the same time and listen. And and I and I think that that is part of human ecology to be at performance, mm-hmm. to be at something that's ethereal. And if you have seen Reggie Watts perform, yeah. and I have, you've had an experience that like you never forget and weirdly you can bring in a camera you can shoot reggie mm-hmm. doing it. and i've seen many reggie watts videos as well and they're fun and they're funny but they're they're not the same yeah. as when you're there it's magic what he does right so i'm 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 with you on that the ethereal thing definitely and i was happy to stay in that zone for a long time in the 70s i came to new york in the mid 70s and through the 80s Unfortunately, by 1982-83, my wife and I were literally starving. I was just about 30, and it wasn't working. Mm. This system, this plan, this live on the Lower East Side and live on dust thing. And I wanted to make something happen. I couldn't figure out. I got a show, my sh- one of my shows moved off Broadway, I got 600 bucks a week, and I thought, okay, I'll do this for a while, but this is not tenable. Whatever we're doing here is not working. And about a year or so later, for the first time, I got introduced to Hollywood, and Mm. they were like signing anybody who they thought could write a screenplay, and I got a contract with Fox. And this was what I, you know, I. I was like, yeah, money. I want money. But I never had the same soul connection. And I have plenty of friends who do have that with film. Like, because I've worked with Richard Linklater mm-hmm. and Robert Altman and Woody um, Allen. And, Woody Allen and, and of course, Adam McGoyan and all these guys. And they love movies. They, they eat, breathe, and sleep. Iris Sachs, all these guys, movies, movies, movies. I don't have that feeling about movies. Hmm. I like movies. But I have that feeling about theater. Yeah. And I love that magic. When I, I was on Broadway a couple of years ago, 
and um, when you're there's something I'm bigger about being and you're in a scene with other people and eight times a week you say the same words and you're in the same place and you're doing the same thing and the lights and everything it's it feels almost identical to the other times mm -hmm. It's weird. It's like you're in a some kind of weird time machine and you're going back and reliving this beat in your life over and over and over again, like Groundhog Day, right? Yeah. And uh, it was, it was, it's magic to me. I just love it. I love it. And, and I think it says so much about who we are, what we're actually doing, because life is just slipping away from us every single second, but mm. I get to be in that beat yeah. again and again and again. Anyway. Well, you know, you've, you've had a, you've had a number of, uh, of your plays uh, adapted. You've, you've, you've made a couple of films. Um, you know, there was the Oliver Stone film and I'm wondering is it, does a project like that come about because you're interested in, in having more people see it? How, how did that get turned into a film? Well, the, the, look, first of all, in the world we live in today, yeah. it's very exciting to just make a film. It would be sure. the same as like, sure. you want to go climb Mount Everest, why not? It sounds yeah. like it's really scary, fun, crazy thing. Now, some people want to keep climbing Mount Everest again and again and again until they fall off or freeze to death. I personally, I don't have, I don't wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to make another movie yeah. like the one I did with Oliver, but I'm really happy that I did. So I think that's the first and foremost mm -hmm. thing was, man, there's this experience that seems like it must be incredible yeah. and I get to do it. And I also knew that talk radio was going to be killer. And I mean, today it's over, I'm 62. Um, I don't know that I'm looking for killer experiences all the time, but at that point, particularly coming out of the punk scene and all of that, I wanted to do things that were going to be completely balls to the wall, would destroy mm -hmm. me. And making that movie was close to that. We were doing, we're on a crazy budget, crazy schedule. I'm doing at least 12, 13 hours a day, but I'm in every scene and I'm rewriting and shooting. So it was a complete experience. I think complete experiences are really to be cherished, but you don't, you can't have them all the time. Yeah. So that was number one. Yeah. Definitely was intrigued by, and I will admit to being, that having been very poor, money was, has great gravitational pull. But I won't do things, uh, just for money because I live by the code of the Tibetan Book of the Dead and I stay away from things that divert me from my path and money is a sort of a weird representational thing of like this is going to solve everything in your life and it it fucking won't so I was going to ask don't I, go there I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure that you know you've gotten the, the Cassavetes comparison before you know the idea of sort of going out there and making these big blockbuster movies and using that to fund your art but that's not the way you you approach that no i uh, no i mean if i had the choice to do it all the time uh that would be a plan i think cassavetes had a little bit more of an option to do that mm -hmm. he was a genuine star uh however when i did under siege 2 yeah. with seagal there, there was no, I mean, immediately that money started going into production mm. as soon as I started getting the paychecks. I set up a production office. I, I made some stuff that, frankly, nobody's ever seen. But I was, overall, there was definitely an idea that you're always tilling the soil. You're always keeping it, keeping the whole thing alive. I don't want to be in a situation where I have to make a decision about what work I do based on the fact I don't have any money. Mm -hmm. So I did want to be somewhat secure and I did manage to do that. I, I, you know, even the only time I thought to myself, oh, you're selling out was when I did the Seagal movie. But that's still not true because I did want to do an action movie. Yeah. And I, because there were like things on my bucket list and one was an action movie. And it isn't like I need to do a million action movies, but that was a great one to do. And I wanted to be the bad, and guy, the bad guy. And I want to be the bad guy in the action movie. Yeah. And I have to say that one of my greatest, fondest memories is being at Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, going in an opening night, walking the red carpet, going in. I hadn't seen the movie yet. My face is 40 feet high. I mean, come on. It's, mm -hmm. It was great. But... Um, if you if you ask me what's the experience you want to repeat again and again yeah. and again and again it would be live theater that's the thing that i can't live without that i would i i wouldn't you said oh you're never going to be able to step on a stage again mm. that would make i mean i'm going to williamstown next week i mean it's it's pays bupkis but i get to work with great actors um uh, i'm working with um uh, jessica hecht and um 
uh, Hallie Pfeiffer and Justin Long, and we're in this great play, and um, like Daniel Goldfarb called Legacy, and it's all about the acting. I mean, rehearsal, I love rehearsal. <laughs> like, when you talk about shooting a movie, if I re think back about shooting every movie, every TV show, all I remember is there's all this equipment around and there's cables on the floor and I'm gonna say some stuff that I memorized and I'm gonna just repeat it. As opposed to that time at Bumbershoot at Seattle when I was doing one of the solo shows and it was a kick and ass. Or I, the night I stepped out on stage with Alicia Silverstone and did the uh, Time Stand Still on Broadway. There's this like really memorable, true experience. And I'm not saying this is everybody should have this philosophy. It just happens to be my philosophy. So wait, so how, wait, how does rehearsal play into that? What's so exciting about rehearsals? It's just meeting. Is it is it doing with it with somebody the first time? Is it trying things out? Uh, yeah, because you got this malleable reality that keeps changing depending on the way that yeah. you do it, and. You know, for me, bottom line, making believe I'm somebody else is tremendously satisfying and visceral for me. Um, I don't know what I think about people who like have decided they want to be an actor or they want to learn how to be an actor and things. Mm. I feel like I was always this way, yeah. that I just have an, you know, I mean, everybody plays sports and I mean, everybody could act if they want to, but not everybody can throw a 90 mile an hour fastball. And as an actor, I just, you know, it, it's not like that guy that can throw that fastball should say, like, he, sure, he, he practiced and everything, but he had something that was born in him that allowed him to do that, mm -hmm. and there was something born in me that lets me become other people. And when I do become other people, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic feeling because, and I've had a hard time really putting my finger on this over the years, but like De Niro said once in a very rare interview, uh, you get to be the person without the consequences of being the person. Mm, mm. And I see my every moment in my life as yeah. filled with consequences. Yeah. You know, like you walked in here and I took a temper tantrum about some bullshit and I'm already thinking of the consequences like Brian is going to hate me forever. No. He's going to like go talk to people and say <laughs> what a dick this guy was. But if I was You're a character... You're nice on audio. That's the important part. But if I was a character yeah. and I did that... Yeah. We would be like, really, it would be like, wow, Edward Norton is like so fucking amazing. He plays that angry guy so mm -hmm. well, you know. It doesn't make any difference if he's like that or not like that in real life. So, so I love the freedom of being completely another person. It's very relaxing for me. Um, sometimes, um, I mean, certainly when I was younger, I played very powerful people, mm -hmm. and that was another real thrill. I mean, like the bad guy in the Under Siege. Yeah. But I grew up in a kind of a tough town and there were a lot of tough guys around who scared the hell out of me, uh, including like outlaw biker types and so forth. And, and you know, I was just terrorized with them. But when I got to play characters, I could be mm -hmm. the outlaw biker guy and it was kind of fun. To yeah, it's that. interesting that you were so drawn to the evil guy under, under siege because that's the ultimate, you know, you can go home and you can sleep at night. After you're done playing oh, that absolutely. character, absolutely. Is this recording, by yeah. the way? Are you sure? It's yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm. I, I keep my I've eyes keep hitting. I've been hitting audio weirdness. I just want you to look at that photo up there on the wall, even though the people listening can't see it. The second down from the top. Can you see that? Is that Jerry Lewis? That's that's no, that's oh. me in a show called a Ricky <laughs> Paul show. It was pretty insane. Well, if you look at it closely, the yeah. expression on my face, I'm pretty insane in that picture. Yeah. That was like real. That's circa 1980, and that's in a club, and that's like so that character was the most obnoxious character I could possibly pay on a stage. I did him all over the country. I did him in Europe. I did him in Germany. I sig -heiled the audience. I goose-stepped around the stage. I told them that they were a bunch of... This was skinheads in the audience. They were a bunch of wimps and that the building we were in was probably paid for with American money. I mean, the bottles were flying, the spit, people trying to get on stage. It was just war every time we did. I opened for Flipper. I opened for Mission <laughs> of Burma. I opened for Ween. I've opened for Sonic Youth. That was like a whole other life that I had when I was, and it was, although I wasn't, I mean, I'm, I have a mic in my hand, but I couldn't actually do anything like sing or anything. So I just came out and was incredibly obnoxious and played the Mud Club and all these different places, tier three, and, um, and, and the old studio when it was a punk club and those places. And it was just, a, it was a hell of a lot of fun. It was all about how, how far can I yeah. go? without exploding, literally exploding on stage. Eventually I figured out that 
the audience, I couldn't go far enough. Like if I came out and I poured gasoline on myself and lit myself on fire in those clubs, they'd be like, yay, that's cool. So I thought, well, this isn't really what I want to be doing. Um, well, because you, it was like you, Gigi Allen was running around at the same time. Yes, you know, absolutely. Flipper, right? I absolutely. Mean, you were very much... It, it wouldn't have been that that uh, much of a surprise for you to come out and do it and not Karen to salute. Finley, all that yeah. crazy stuff. I remember the night Karen. I didn't even know she was doing it. Uh, we were at Danceteria, and and she was it Danceteria or one of those places. Anyway, somebody backstage like Karen's on stage. She's taking all her clothes off and she's pouring peaches on her head, and so everything was like how trans. Um, whatever the word transgressive yeah. this stuff can be so i thought well wait a minute that's not really what i'm doing i'm doing theater i want to do theater i want the energy of the club but i want it on stage so where can i contain this and then as you see above that is barry champlain at the public in talk radio with michael wincott and i was kept trying to think how can i make theater pieces yeah. that can have that energy that happens in a club but on stage so very explosive crazy kind of, well, I don't like the word crazy, but very energized characters. But you're, you're an actor first. I mean, it, that, that comes more naturally to you than writing. Well, I'm a good, yeah, I was born actor. Um, I can act. I do act. I've acted in, you know, yeah. movies, TV shows and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think I'm kind of like an action painter when I was doing this stuff, mm -hmm. an action painter who's really good at drawing, but you can't tell that by looking at the action painting because it looks like a lot of splatters and everything. But he knows how to draw already. Now he wants to do something else that's interesting to him. So that was, yeah. So the acting was that. Then I started creating these... Um, all different. I wrote a million different things. I mean, the the bottom pictures are from something called the New World, and that had mm -hmm. music by Glenn Branca. That's like also a long time ago. Nobody even remembers this. The one in the middle is a play called Sheer Heaven, where I wrote a play and I cast an entire Latino cast, had them translated into Spanish, perform it in. Sp I don't speak Spanish, uh -huh. and perform it in Spanish for Anglo audiences, yeah. so they wouldn't be able to understand a word of what anybody said. So these were the early shows, and then I started making the solo shows around 1980 and when I wrote the monologues for them mm -hmm. the the uh the doing the monologues again and again and again I kind of learned how to write I learned how to edit I learned how I learned about structure I learned about how funny happens and then when Joe Papp said you can come here and do whatever you want I'd already been there a couple of times at the public and I said, well, I have this idea for this play, Talk Radio. And at that time, it was only the callers. It was only the people, because that was all monologues. And I needed to come up with a plot. Yeah. And so I kept working and working, and eventually I came up with a plot, and I ended up with a play. I mean, I'd been in theater since I was a kid, but it took me a while to learn something about play structure, and I don't claim to be you know, a whiz at it, but I did pull off Talk Radio, and I did pull off Suburbia, they worked out and then I did a number of other plays which unfortunately have not come into New York but are I think are pretty great but I kept writing plays 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 while doing the solo stuff solo 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 stuff and then um, around 2000 I just completely shifted gears and got into writing novels and I just wrote a bunch of novels and then I wrote this history book mm -hmm. which I've been on for the last five years but anyway, sorry, drifted off. There. Oh, that's 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 fine. No, it's it's just interesting. I mean, you know, there there seems to be two very distinct sides. There's this um, there's this part of you that wants to almost I don't know if alienate the audience is, is quite the right w way to put uh, to put it, but you know, to certainly like uh, get them out of their comfort zone. And then and then there's the the part of you that's sort of uh, doing these really big budget movies and and doing like Law and Order and things like that. You know, yeah. being in as as many living rooms as possible. And it seems like you know, I don't know, is, is the 100 Monologues projects kind of splits the difference between the two. Yeah, 100 Monologues was, I realized about three years ago that the, all these monologue shows I'd done, that, that there were actually 100 monologues. If you also include a couple from mm -hmm. talk radio and so forth. And, uh, and then these friends of mine, because I'm now part of, I didn't start out as part of the theater scene in New York, but I am now. And so I have all these friends who are just fantastic character actors or just wonderful actors. Uh, and somebody said, I think it was at a poker game or something, somebody was like... So all the, the, all the good yeah, ideas yeah, happen. It was like, you know, Bobby Cannavale or somebody saying, you know, I could do one of those 
I could mm. do one of those. What would you think of that? And then we got into this idea, which at first I didn't realize what a, it wasn't like the easiest idea in the world to, to do was, oh, I'll just shoot all these guys yeah. doing these monologues. So Dylan Baker did one and Richard Kind has done one and, and they're all on this website, 100monologues.com. What I mean to say, though, is that I didn't understand, of course, that everybody, th- these guys are not small potatoes. They're all SAG yeah. actors. They're all yeah. stars. I can't just shoot them and just post it because yeah. it's the union would come after me. So we had to create, you know, we had to create a company and we had to create, we had to really become real. And so we formed this production company and the actors have all been volunteering their time. Uh, but we've been slowly but surely. Also, you got to catch these guys. I mean, some of them, they're just like in and out of town or they're not a vis- Sam Rockwell or somebody. It's like, Sam, can you do it next week on you know Wednesday? And we shoot him and he learns his bit and, he, and we do it. But slowly but surely, we now have 50 of them on the site. We're going to start shooting some more, um, I think, in late July. It, it, uh, I mean, I don't know if the transgressive part is in there because I think almost you lose transgressive the minute that it's that it is filmed because there, there's no way somebody watching yeah. is going to be feel like I, I guess they're I guess, like I guess what threatened I meant was you know when 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 these were initially written you know talk talk radio aside and some some of the larger pieces aside there there's this knowledge that you know you're writing a monologue that it's, this is not you know maybe the vehicle isn't necessarily out there for it to to get in front of a lot of people. But you've, yeah. you've found that. Like you've, you've, you've well, it changed over time. I mean, when I started doing them and I did in the very first shows, it was very inspired by like New York and stuff. So if I came out, I played like a really dirty bum and I was like this filthy bum. When I first started doing those shows, people were very threatened by these guys. Hmm. Uh, be, I know this sounds like a thousand years ago, but there was a TV show called Living Color. Sure. And they had uh, this bum, this yeah. crusty. And, they're, they're, well, and then later also on... Um, Krusty the Clown on the on the yeah. on the cartoon the Simpsons, yeah. on the Simpsons, but these guys were not, there wasn't like anything like that, and then they started these things started showing up yeah. more and more and more. I mean, there were guys doing crazy stuff like that a long time ago, but nobody remembers. Like Robert Klein used to play junkies, and he would do it on like Merv Griffin. It'd be like. Wow, what's he doing? What what is a junkie? But but watching The Simpsons and having being in a live theater situation where you don't you don't have any context for it at all, and this it was aggressive. It was aggressive. <laughs> it was yeah. very loud. It was hard to follow. What happened also was that between 1980 and 2000, when I stopped doing them, I became better known Mm -hmm. so I'm not just some anonymous guy out there jumping around on a stage being crazy I'm that guy that you just saw in a movie Mm -hmm. so then there's like it sort of tempers it also I learned how to be funny I didn't even know how if you pause at this certain place and then you say the line that's funny and so what happens is you can't not be funny once you learn how Mm -hmm. to be funny and you just because it's too pleasurable yeah. to make an audience laugh so over the years i got funnier and funnier and funnier i learned how to really make these these beats work and and then eventually it was like entertainment and i was touring and i was you know doing that thing and then i was like wait a minute wait a wait a minute this wasn't what i started out by doing i started out by saying i want to make some kind of crazy ass theater that's in your face yeah. now i'm showing up at college campuses yeah. doing a bum on a stage it's a very different thing and so it's like vaudeville at that point absolutely which is there's nothing to take away from it it just wasn't yeah. the original idea and so and i get bored and i want to go into another thing and um, so what I did was I shifted gears right around 2000. It was actually after the, the pl- after 9-11. Yeah. And I just said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm not going to do this anymore. And then I will do it once in a while, like as a benefit or something mm-hmm. like that. And then, of course, like a couple of years ago, these guys all started doing it for the website. So it's there on the website. Um, I mean, things change as time goes on it's not like you were wrong and now you're right or you were right and now you're wrong it's just that for me once I've had an experience I don't need to do that experience a million times I mean what makes experience exciting for me is its rareness I mean for instance there's a really fancy restaurant down the street Boulay Mm -hmm. you go to Boulay it's an experience if you go to Boulay every night it would be torture 
it would be like, oh my God, I have to go to Boulay again tonight. And when I, by the time I was doing eight shows a week of the solo shows compared to the, the clubs and things I used to do it in, it had become like kind of a job. And I, and I want to do di- very different things. That's why, I mean, th- th- I just spent seven years on a yeah. history book about a bunch of Armenian assassins. It came out of like almost nowhere. And yet the deeper I got into it, not being a scholar, not being a historian, um, kind of being a detective, I guess, from my roles on TV. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but I mean, the, the whole unwinding yeah. of this was fantastic. It was like a whole new world I didn't know anything about. Yeah. We were getting into the British archives. We were doing research. I was reading a million books. I am kind of bookish, and I think that that's a part of me that maybe isn't like immediately apparent i mean if you lived in my household you know that i'm reading endlessly and then i'm lecturing you about whatever i read about today like yeah. you'll never believe what i learned today about like concentration camps or something as though, as though it's something that. that you've known for your entire life yeah i'm just i'm just big i love <laughs> yeah. information i mean it's almost talk about the ineffable i mean in our noggins or our lives and experience and then one day we're not here anymore yeah. and so much for that well, this this gets again. This gets back to this um, idea of kind of a, ethereal art versus uh, this this project, which is kind of saved for for posterity. I mean, the fact that this is something that you can watch at any time. You know, I guess it's, what is it, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle? You know, if, if you observe it, that you change it. Um, I, I I imagine just the mere fact of of shooting these, putting them on the internet, and hosting them up theoretically forever, makes them different. Yes, because they get frozen, the beats get frozen, and um, of course there's not that... We, we know that the people playing them are not the guy that wrote them, yeah. and so when I was doing them, it's a whole package. Like, this is, this is Eric in his... This is the way he thinks, and this is him performing and everything happening at once. Um, yeah, that's... Um, it, does, it does change by, by existing... I was thinking of something else, and now I completely forgot. What I well, I, was, I, I had heard I had heard you talk. I was I was um, listening to an interview on the way here, and I'd heard you talk about uh, how you developed the the talk radio character, and and this and, and this I think gets back to this idea of, um, in a sense, being an actor before you're a writer is is literally just channeling the character, sort of sitting in a, in a room and being that person and then writing those words down on paper and that you know and, and that's that's the disconnect between having somebody else play this character is this is this is you right the all of these characters are in a sense you they've come yeah. out of you in a very organic way yeah and they and then these actors have to interpret it but that means that sometimes and certainly when i write plays this was the case the actor shows me things that i yeah. didn't know was in there that's interesting and they and i hear things being done differently yeah. and that's and that's happened in in this case too uh this is also this thing is a community thing it's a thing for us the actors that are in it mm-hmm. and and very importantly and this comes up when we shoot them we're having fun and that may seem obvious uh because we're used to the notion that if you get hired to be on a tv show and then they go and they interview the people on the show they're oh we're all having yeah. such a great time yeah. but i'm t- dude i'm coming from a time when I, we were in clubs and we were just rocking it and being very, very crazy, as crazy as we could be night after night, no commercial thing, nothing, just like who could do the most insane shit on these stages? I mean, right across the street from here, there was a thing called the uh, um, No Wave New York mm-hmm. uh, concerts and it was a place called Artist Space and the contortions were there and everything. Yeah. This was for nobody outside the community. Yeah. This was like word of mouth told everybody, be there and check it out, Lydia Lunch or whoever, with Teenage sure. Jesus and the Jerks, whoever was there that night. And whatever happened that night actually was the fertilizer from which Sonic Youth came. Yeah. But Sonic yeah. Youth was the public face of this. Those bands all went out of business. So the fun, the true visceral fun of making work, when we shoot this shit, these 100 monologues, and these guys come in, it's funny because they're all pros, and they're just used to such, like, being having it all tightened down, and, and, and I have a very young crew, and this crew is, like, goofing. I mean, they're pros, but they are, they're into what the guy is doing, and when you see Peter Scanavino or 
or, or Richard Kind or whoever yeah. doing some crazy stuff out there. We're all like getting into it. And by the end of the session, they're like, wow, that was fun. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, remember fun? Remember before <laughs> this was a job? Remember when we used to have a good yeah. time doing what we do? And I mean, I come up in a period when there was a lot of that, the 70s, uh, because there was nothing at stake. Nothing cost much. The rents weren't much, sure. nothing. And so we could be goofing, and from that came all kinds of very exciting, fun work. Sadly, if you think that every time you go out to make work, you've got this huge, ah, oh, there's a record company guy out there in the audience. Yeah. Maybe this is my big night. I mean, sure, you want to have that moment in your career at some point, but you want to have that other thing too, which frankly, I think has been happening again in the sort of, or at least was, you know, five, six years ago when the Brooklyn sort of underground mm -hmm. started to develop then all this exciting work started to happen again. It has to be by and for the people who make, like the people who make the work have to be part of the community that the community is coming to see the work. And yeah. all of the, um, uh, I was just, uh, our director for um, the Daniel Goldfarb play is Oliver Butler. And he's a member of this thing called the Debate Society. Fucking awesome theater group who does crazy stuff. Uh, next to me is uh, when we're rehear rehearsing Hallie Pfeiffer, who writes amazing, crazy plays. And this stuff is on the fringes, you know. Yeah. This is, you know, they try. The Times is trying to be hip and trying to like <laughs> catch up, but it didn't start with that. Yeah. It started with them making their friends laugh. This started with me thinking, what's going to make my friends? What's going to be the biggest goof? What's going to be like, whoa, he really did it this time. That's, that's making work. That's really, that's a blast. I'm sure there's some other kind of making work, you know, like commercial, like I know what will make an audience. I'm going to sit there like a scientist and like figure out how it, but I've never been that guy. I'm not a craftsman like that. But, but that's the interesting thing here is like, you know, the, 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 the setup, you know, the, the sort of, what it takes to shoot one of these things versus um, the, I guess, the circumstances that the monologues came out of initially are, were very different. So I, I've got to imagine that um, in, in this sort of situation where they're sort of, you know, standing around the black backdrop and there's a couple people filling them, that maybe it's not as easy to instantly turn on, like, you know, like, like the rage, for example. Cause well, because it doesn't have to it. be that. I mean, one of the things, yeah, you, things happen as you mature as an artist. I can do things today that I couldn't do before. I can write longer pieces. I can write a history yeah. book because yeah. I, I didn't have that focus, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, likewise, I can see opportunities for what can make this a good piece. It may not be that piece that you're talking about from 30 years ago in some punk club, mm -hmm. but it's this piece. And what makes this piece the best of this that I can yeah. make today. And I'm gonna play the cards as they lie. So the cards are, I got this monologue, I got this actor who's awesome, and I have this great crew. And with these, also the cameras we're using are, you know, there wasn't ever cameras sure. like this before. We can shoot the shit out of stuff yeah. for cheap. Yeah. And so that's my cards. How do I make the best thing I can with this group of ingredients that will satisfy me? Because for me, it's always, what would I like to see? Yeah. What, not what would I think an audience wants to see, but if I walk in a theater and the curtain opens, what do I wish was up there? Which I take from Richard Foreman, which is why his early pieces had all these naked women walking around on stage, because basically he was like, I want to see a naked woman walk There's across the, here. the Monty Python sketch where, where the guy can pick any way to die. Oh, I don't know. Chooses, it's, I think it's from uh, uh, Meaning of Life, so he chooses to be chased off a cliff by 100 naked women. <laughs> Well, that's the. Yeah. <laughs> well, they were brilliant. I mean, yeah. you, you want to keep amusing yourself. You want to keep entertaining yourself. Yeah. I mean, again, things change over life. Once I've done a certain number of law and orders, I don't need to do any more law and orders, even though they paid me a lot of money. Um, and I've had that experience, but also the taste of an older person is different than the pay taste of a younger person. And there's no getting away from with from that. I mean, I think every artist thinks that it's just like automatic that everybody should love their work but that why would that be true yeah. i mean if a guy thinks that it'd be really interesting to make a piece about contemplating his limp dick that may not be interesting <laughs> to a 25 year old because they're not they're not in that space but maybe a guy who's 75 that's all he's thinking about every day doesn't mean everybody wants to see it 
Um, and I know my taste is different because there's so many. Right now we have this enormous palette on television and I know that I can choose from many, many things and many of them I have no interest in. Yeah. I don't care about them. And I know that a lot of other people do like them, but I, they just do nothing for me. And there's plenty of good reasons for that. I mean, maybe I heard that joke 20 times before and I just don't need to see it anymore or I know that plot line or I, uh, that actor's good, but I know a better actor who does the same sort of thing. So at any rate, um, I mean, staying fresh creatively is is interesting, particularly from my perspective, because generating new work all the time, generating new thoughts, um, maybe that's not where I'm at now, hmm. uh, as opposed to this is a history book which required yeah. research or revisiting the monologues which I already wrote or acting in something where somebody else wrote the lines. None of those things ask me to suddenly generate mm. because those that stuff that I used to write, um, it was just blowing out of me. I mean, I just, I couldn't get the ideas down fast enough. It was the way my brain worked. And I'm, I don't want to, you know, people are afraid that they're going to like sound old or something. Good news for you, we all get old. And it's better to get old because then you means you're not dead. Do, do, that is worse. Do, do you think? Do you, I mean, does it ebb and flow, or are you just are you just out of that period? I mean, will you? Well, start? I do think. I think that there is there is a time in your life where you're figuring a lot of stuff out. Yeah, it probably starts around puberty. I don't think life is terrible unless you're having your ass kicked every day, which I was before puberty, which created problems in life. Sure. But once you hit puberty, everybody has a problem that they're trying to figure yeah. out because yeah. God in his infinite wisdom yeah. created this thing called sex that nobody can figure out. And that somehow, I mean, who ever, who's a philosopher before puberty? It's impossible to philosophize and yet you want to know the meaning of life mm. by the time you're 20. It's like, so why are we here? What is this all about? You get to 40 and you're like, you know what? I don't even know if I know what the answer is, but I don't even fucking care anymore. And you move into other modes of things that are of interest to you. So yeah, the, it, it changes. And, and all of that energy that I was into was constantly rolling around in my brain a number of um, themes that I was just like stuck to, like flypaper, like my ambition. I mean, I had insane ambition, insane appetites, appetites, you know, not just f for everything, you know, like Iggy Pop says, I yeah. want more. That was it. And that changed. And um, today I don't seem to have these pressing issues, but then there are other things that you can't avoid. As you go, Again, like I said, they're not necessarily of great interest to other people. The fact that the baby boomers are, I'm in the middle of the baby boom thing, they always seem to think that whatever they're thinking about sure. is the most interesting thing. Yeah. And it may not be, but it's still interesting to a lot of baby boomers. So we have, you know, new TV shows about people being really old and stuff and it's so boring. But do, do you, when, 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 um, when, you, when you approach an, uh, an actor to, to do one of these or, you know, hopefully in the f future an actor approaches you, um, do you feel the need to explain the monologue to them? Do you feel the need to explain to them like where you were and what you were thinking at the time? We work on it just as script. They get first of all, they get a choice of about three different scripts that I think would be right for them. Fortunately, the actors have been willing to go along with um, being somewhat typecast. Yeah. So, for example, Steve Lang, who often plays military men, he's the bad guy in um, Avatar. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I said, could you play like a military guy for me? And he was like, yeah, no problem. I'll do that. You know, so guys are doing things that we, we know. So that gets rid of a whole bunch of shorthand. So I said, okay, so we'll choose between these sure. three things. Sure. And then we break it down. We just break it down. Like, um, Josh Charles plays a, like a, like a, a suit kind of guy, which is what he always plays in movies and he's on, you know, um, the good wife is, well, he's not there anymore. Will, um, but He's also familiar with this territory, so we already are halfway there. And then we sit and we break down the, the sketch and we look at it. Again, I'm talking, one of the things that was really interesting to me as a young actor, becoming an older actor, is that when I showed up on the scene, I didn't know any actors as good as I was. <laughs> I was good and I was killer. Maybe I thought I was better than I was, but I was good. I, never, I didn't have any respect for anybody that I work with. Whenever I was in a play, I was always the best guy. Now, all those people that are in my shoes all come to New York and eventually form yeah. the community yeah. of actors. Yeah. So then you're next to all these other people who they're the bad, they're good, they're good. Mm -hmm. they're, everybody I know is, all my friends are like awesome actors. But they all have different 
methodologies yeah. to break stuff down. And I love doing that. So that's what we do when we work on it. So when you sit and you talk to Michael Stuhlbarg about how he's going to do his bit, as opposed to the way Jessica Hecht is going to do her bit, or Jen Tilly, each one's hitting it a different way. They ask you different kinds of questions. They want to know about the character. Sometimes they get as fine as like, I don't understand well, this word. What do you mean by this word? Like gee, I don't know. I didn't. I just wrote it. I didn't really think about but it. You that don't much. ever. You don't ever have the impulse to say no, no, no. That's not what I meant. No, no, no. That's that's not what I was trying to convey. I'm trying to move with them because yeah. I kind of believe in the um, collaboration between actor and writer. It's something very interesting to me. I believe great actors are authors themselves, mm. and they bring authorship to what they do. Uh, greatest examples are like looking at movies and imagining. You know, it isn't this guy, it's some other guy sure. playing the role. And then you realize, oh, it would be a completely different yeah. movie. So, I mean, you hear those stories. Like, who was who was it? it was supposed to be the Godfather? The original Godfather wasn't going to be Marlon Brando. It was going to be somebody yeah. else. You know, and it was like, you know, Jackie Gleason or somebody. Or it's like, like, or it's yeah. like you know, it's like hearing a cover song. Or I remember if, you know, I was listening to the um, uh, original Blood on the Tracks. Yeah. He did two totally different versions of that. Wow. Yeah. And... It just doesn't work, and you don't know if it's just because you're so used to the new version, or the you know the yeah. current version. But it just it just doesn't make any sense, and a slight change in everything makes all the difference in the world. Well, that familiarity, I mean, is a big part of the way the mass media, uh, we we do we we have a kind of a we get impressed or we imprinted by stuff. So like. You get used to watching a star like Tommy Lee Jones, and he starts to look like you've always known him. Yeah. And of course there's a Tommy Lee Jones. And if there wasn't a Tommy Lee Jones, we'd have to invent one. But the thing is, is that in fact, what's happened over time is you've gotten used to Tommy Lee Jones, and you become, you know what I mean? It's like, well, do you, do th you this, this is the way it works in, in the way that we're all yeah. unique as people, and actors have to sort of be characters, but also be this larger version of themselves. In fact, what actually I believe happens is you start to behave in the way that people expect you to behave. So like in real life, I'm not Mr. Sarcastic, outspoken guy, but I played this guy in talk radio. Yeah. I got a certain kind of feedback and I became more and more like that publicly and it starts to become my personal style, yeah. which then Anthony Bourdain stole from me. And now I have to go around hearing, you know, that people think I'm Anthony Bourdain when in fact, Anthony Bourdain is me. Even even beyond that, I'm, I'm sorry, sure you, Anthony. You, you, I think you're awesome. I'm, I'm I'm sure that you you get this all the time as somebody who, as as a character actor, as somebody who you, you know beyond like Law and Order and some of the larger roles, who you know you you might be somebody who's on screen for a, a few minutes. You know the the Woody Allen movie is a good example of that. So you must have the experience of people walking up to you on the street thinking that you were their neighbor or you were just somebody that they knew in their life, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I am one of those guys yeah. that's like familiar, but they're not quite sure. Weirdly, my voice seems to be the thing that gives me away mm. more than anything else. People, for some reason, remember my voice. Yeah. Also depends on what segment of the population you're talking about. So like when I go through uh, security checks at airports where most of the the guys are like from the nabe uh from the hood uh they all have seen under siege yeah. too like everybody knows me from that or used to now my hair's all white so maybe they don't recognize me as much um i i think when i first started getting that kind of feedback on the street it was very impressive to me i kind of dug it sure then i was eventually annoyed by it now I just understand that it's a function of something that's beyond me and you and everybody. Yeah. The mass media does something to our minds collectively, and I'm no more immune to it than anybody else. I mean, if I see somebody, I was I was at the White House Correspondents' Dinner this year, and it was like every two feet was another yeah. famous person, and I'm like, I'm just gaga checking them all up. Mm -hmm. like I, I couldn't believe it. Like, there's, there's Judge Scalia. Wow, there he, I can touch him. Um, there's, uh, I, I told you before that uh, Taylor Swift lives next door here downstairs and people literally come to her front door and stand there and have their picture taken in front of an anonymous loft building simply because she's in there somewhere maybe like and they're so excited when they do it I yeah. mean really think about that how bizarre that is 
it, it, it's inter- it's interesting um you know that I, I, the, thus far at least that you've been kind of playing to not only people's strengths for the the monologue project but playing to th- sort of the characters that they've been known for over the years and is that is that part of just you know that's your understanding of them as a person is these roles that they've played um you know why not i guess why not try to make them stretch a little bit more why not try to get a square peg in a round hole i'm just cheating uh (laughs) i just want you know their essence yeah in some cases they do do something different than it you know it really depends they're all very busy Mm -hmm. and i can only get them for about a week and given that i'm not even paying them yeah you know, most of these guys are making, I don't know what they make, $25,000 a day or something. So, you know, to get them to even do it. Um, and I want them to be able to give full attention to the performance so we don't have to worry a lot about, you know, we're going to change you completely. Yeah. Because we do exist in a world where the actors play. We, we Those of us who have careers and keep working all the time, we do serve sort of purposes in the language of character that exists for the general population i'm a bad guy i always play bad guys i play jewish guys all the time i'm not even jewish but i represent whatever that is for the american psyche that this is what a jewish guy is is like what i am um some people are always playing good guys some people ingenues it's easy to see that obviously if you think of extreme cases I'm not going to play like a linebacker in a movie about football because I'm not built that way. And the guy that does play the linebacker is not going to play Barry Champlain in talk radio. This is the world we live in. We live in a world of characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, We we do it all the time without even consciously knowing it. Like you go to the doctor, doctor behaves a certain way, the way a doctor should behave. You go to the garage, the the, the mechanic behaves a certain way. If you went to the doctor's office and the doctor said, yeah, come on, come right in here and sit down and, uh, uh, you know, I'll I'll be with you in a second, you would think that's not the way a doctor should be talking. But if the mechanic says, yeah, just bring it in and uh, I'll get to your car in a second, you're like, well, that's a mechanic. That's the way he should talk. So we're all doing this. The actors who have the hardest times are the guys who don't fall into some kind of discreet, uh, and the guys who work all the, unless you're talking about the geniuses, you know, uh, Phil Hoffman, Kevin yeah. Spacey, these guys, they look like nothing. Yeah. They look like every man, but their ability, their ability to act is just like off the charts. And so we, we love watching. And yet I think part of it is we know that every man is pretending to, you know, we're enjoying the fact that they're acting. Yeah. That they're, yeah you, you, you said something, I'm pretty sure you said this before, uh, the, the, the mics turned on and, and this was interesting to me was, um, this idea of almost, um, taking the, the character actors, taking the small roles and, and, and following them a little bit beyond that. And you seem to, you seem to, and maybe, maybe this is, uh, because you've played these roles yourself, you seem to have an affinity for that, for, for, for those people, for, for those characters. I just think character actors are more interesting. Um, yeah. And very often we see character actors rise to lead roles because they're so fascinating to watch. And you, you'll have a guy like that, a, an Adam Driver, who is just starts out as like the kookiest, weirdest guy you've ever seen on a TV show. And now he's becoming a lead guy because he's got such complexity to him. He's yeah. great to watch. Um, but there's a lot of things that character actors do that are just more... Um, there's more craft involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, the history of an actor's life is that when you're a baby, you just play babies. You can't play anything other than babies, and you do it very well. When you're 11 years old, you can play a little kid. If you've got some esprit, it's fun to have an 11-year-old be an 11-year-old in a movie, teenager, and so forth. Somewhere around 27, actors start to become they can actually transform mm-hmm. into different people. And they will do that until they get to be in their late 50s, and then they start playing granddads and old people and that transformative thing. So that, that, that period in the middle that I'm fascinated by, actors who are between 30 and 50, mm-hmm. who can do this transformative thing, that's a real craft thing. Leading guys don't do that. We don't expect to see um, George Clooney be anything different than George Clooney. I'm sure George Clooney would like to play something really different, but we know we pay the money to see George Clooney be leading man, and he's because he is a leading man. Because in real life, he really is a handsome, virile guy. 
but when we go to when we went to see Phil Hoffman or other we see them change that's what we're actually we're excited by and it's fun to watch but but that's you know and and i think there's there's a little bit of a neg- negative connotation around the, this term character actors because you know again like you've got George Clooney on one side playing George Clooney but you, but you tend to at, at least as like a non actor you tend to think of a character actor as somebody who just kind of gets pigeonholed in that same role that just plays that one character well the best the of them time. work work around uh, a sort of a constellation of roles like Dylan Baker is one of the best character actors we have nobody's going to mistake him for a leading man but when he plays the the lead uh, when he plays leading character roles he's doing very different things all the time this is seen as a big um this is a big plus like in the British world where there's way more theater and that's why we've got all these British guys in all our TV shows playing Americans because they love to become somebody different so you you, you have um, yeah, they've taken over haven't they yeah well the guy in the Americans <laughs> the guy in the homeland all these yeah. guys are playing Americans and they're not Americans yeah. Dr. Uh, House and <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and they're more American than Americans which is kind of kind of interesting and goes back to the thing that we're all kind of always playing some kind of role so, um, so I, l- let me ask you this about the the, the site. Um, you know, and you were describing before sort of this this community and that site called 100monologues.com. <laughs> yes, uh, the uh, HTTP. Uh, s- you know, you were describing it before as being a sort of um, a, a community, and, and I think that, that you tend to think of it as uh, the, the ways in which you know you interact with the actors, uh, the actors interact with the, the material. Um, for 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 people out outside of that, for you know the people turning on their computers and looking for just a, a, a site, some some video to watch. What? How are you expecting people to, to interact with that? How are you expecting the, the viewer to interact, to, to go to this page and, and be presented with a hundred different monologues? Well, you know, one of the first things I ever did when I was first starting to write was just write kind of like uh, characters who didn't go anywhere and just stayed in one mode for like five minutes. The guy would just like be, talk the way that guy talked. Yeah. But I didn't have like a plot in it. Yeah. So some of these are kind of like that. They're So I think they're interesting just as writing and watching an mm-hmm. actor inhabit the role. Like this one guy who just talks about how big his dick is for like <laughs> five minutes. I mean, that's just where he's at. Um, <laughs> some of them are more shaped and are really like sketches, like almost like what you'd see on Saturday Night Live. Yeah. And I, I'm, I mean, I don't know how to really give a person a guide map to sure. the whole thing. But uh, I think of this as sort of like a like if you were home sick or something yeah. and you wanted to like just watch one thing after another, they are kind of like potato chips. And once you get into the rhythm of them, yeah. so for instance, the Lisa Joyce bit is, um, which is called Gold Card, is about when you get stuck at the airport and you have this very helpful stewardess who is really not helpful at all. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, oh, I'm sorry you got bounced off that flight. Well, we do have a flight that leaves at four o'clock in the morning with a six hour layover in St. Louis. How would that work for you? You know, on this really friendly voice. And it's like, no, that wouldn't work at all. I don't want to be here in the airport till four in the morning and be stuck in St. Louis for six hours. And so the, these are like more comedic. Um, they vary. There's a couple that are, are real rants, which was something that I kind of created at a certain point. There was a sort of a um, back and forth that happened between me and Dennis Leary in the 90s. And where dudes it, yelling at each other. Well, no, it happened aesthetically, <laughs> whereas Dennis had seen me do some stuff, and he got into the thing of him getting on stage yeah. and sort of ranting. Yep. I think he was also affected by Bill Hicks a little sure. bit. Yeah, and so he did minute. that He did that show where it was he was just like off the, off the hook. And then I saw that show, and I was like, wow, I love this. I want to do some stuff like this. So I started doing some rants as part of my shows. So there's a couple of bits on here that are uh, – we have one that is – that hasn't even posted yet by an amazing actor named Brandon Dearden who has been on The Americans a lot lately and it's called No Crime and it's just a, like a six minute like rant but it's it's very funny it's very energized and it's just and also I have one Vincent D'Onofrio also doing like a mm. one of these homeless guys in the subway who's talking to himself yeah. so you're not going to like look at that and get punchlines yeah. but you're going to look at that and see I don't know uh, uh Good four minutes of crazy guy in the subway. And it's, but it's very, it's but very Dinofrio advanced and Dinofrio and very structured yeah. too. Yeah. Well, it's just, it's just, cause you know, I tend like that. That's sort of how I think about, about this show. And I think that's how people tend to think of things like podcasts is, um, 
how long should it be because how are people going to consume it you know it's just, it's the same with it's the same with theater you know you sort of know when 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 you're presenting a play um, you kind of generally know what it's going to be like that people are going to come they're going to sit well, down yeah yeah some of these are like little plays yeah. um there's one with Sebastian Stan, who is uh, the Winter Soldier in the Captain America mm-hmm. series. Amazing actor. We worked together when he uh, did talk radio on Broadway with Liev Schreiber, and I knew that this guy was amazing. Now, when 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 Sebastian is on uh, Captain America playing the Winter Soldier, yeah. or what is it, something Bucky Barnes or whatever his name is on it, he has to stay within the parameters of. He's like a very sexy bad guy is basically what he is. But Sebastian has a lot of other nuance in him. Mm -hmm. The bit he does is a guy who's decided to quit his job at Starbucks and hitchhike to Alaska, and he's going to live in the wild by himself. Now, that may sound familiar to you because there was this book, Into the Wild, which was very sad about the guy who did that and died out there. So I wrote this thing a long time ago before they made the movie, because they also made a movie that I think Sean Penn directed. Um, I, I, was, I was fascinated by the mindset of this guy, but it ends up being kind of comedic. So Sebastian plays this bittersweet guy who's hitchhiking and talking to this other guy about how he's made this decision to go completely off the grid and go to the middle of nowhere in Alaska. We never say that he's going to die up there. But I think everybody kind of knows that he's going to die up there, that this isn't going to work out well for him. And he talks about his own, what's going to happen when he dies. And he says, I don't care if I, even if it doesn't work out and I end up there and nobody ever sees me again, I don't care. Because like, even if I die up there, I will like become merged with nature and my body will rot and it'll be under a, a, a under an oak tree and the oak will, the acorns will fall into my body butt crack and sprout into an oak tree and then that'll have more acorns and then a little deer will come and eat the acorns and then the deer will be and I'll become the deer. He just like goes off on this complete tripped out thing. Yeah. I love this monologue. I love what Sebastian did with it. And it's a, it's its own little world. It's a, its own little realm. You could just go there and watch that and see like a little short movie and yeah. that's that. As opposed to like I say the summer like SNL sketches sure. and summer. So that's it's like a potpourri of things and um of course, I'm, I'm thrilled to have this writing of mine, you know, locked down and recorded yeah. so that people can see these wonderful actors doing it. And the, 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 in a way, it's sort of the ultimate test of the material because, you know, it's not like a movie where you've got all of these different things playing towards that. It's, it's again, like you said, it's somebody sitting down, st- staring at their computer screen, looking at just an actor in front of a, a black backdrop. So it's, in a sense, it's kind of got a lot working against it, right? I mean, because it's just, it's got to transcend a lot of different things to really be successful. Yeah, it's pure. So you probably have to, you know, chuff a couple of bones as you're watching it, and then it gets a lot better. And I shouldn't say that. I haven't smoked a joint in 30 years, but... Um, Couldn't hurt. Uh, yeah, I mean, the di- the difference between, and, and of course this isn't a strict line, but the difference between art and entertainment is that entertainment comes towards you and gets you to do it. Like, nobody yeah. doesn't understand a juggler. Nobody doesn't understand a lion jumping through a mm-hmm. thing of fire. Or I mean, Captain we, America. We, yeah, we all, we all, but if, if an artist gets you to move yeah. toward them slightly, yeah. into their world slightly, it's not just that, what it is is it transforms you a little bit so after you have that experience then you feel different and i think that that back and forth is is what makes i mean you don't want to do art all the time but but uh i want to watch things every once in a while that make me go out a little bit now sometimes you have the best of both worlds like breaking bad Mm. first episode of breaking bad what the fuck am I watching? I don't know what this is. This guy's got BVDs on yeah. and he's like standing outside of a trailer. I don't know what's happening. I have to meet it halfway or yeah. I can't fall. And those guys continue to, to work that way, which yeah. I think is good. You mentioned Monty Python. Yeah. I mean, Monty Python required that you, you, you had to exert yourself a little bit while sure. you were watching, but that was the fun of it. Right. Yeah. yeah, but but once you're in, you don't have to do any work at all. Yeah. Um. So so we're we're, we're going to time this up for the release of the uh, of, of the Kickstarter. Why? Why? So you know why? You you've already pumped some money into it. Why are you going out and why are you why are you asking people to 
to donate. I ran out of money. I mean, my my uh, I was subsidizing it with residuals from Law and Order, which were pretty hefty. Yeah. And then I just felt, okay, we proved ourselves. We've done 50 of them. Help us do another 50 if you like what you see. And uh, we're not asking for that much. Um, we just have to raise, well, they cost about $1,000 each. Mm. So uh, the actors do it for free. I do it for free. The crew is very minimal. We got a great sound stage we work in. We own our own equipment. And so, you know, right now we have over four hours of material online that cost us $50,000. Go make a four hour movie for $50,000. Yeah. Uh, so there it is. And also, we're not charging anything to anybody yeah. watching it. Yeah. And then, of course, like all Kickstarter things, if you donate something, you get something. We're going to have books and signed books and different things for people if they want to help us get this thing done. It's, um, I mean, I see the acting community of the United States as a community, as a, certainly many of us feel that we're in a community and we interact with each other, we support each other. It also happens to be at its strongest that it's ever been. The American acting community is incredible. We are making more work and we have better actors than we ever have. And this is a really pure yeah. of that world. Um, so I see this as all part of us supporting one another to be part of this. I know there are many, many, many people out there who see themselves as part of it. We, we who are working in New York City or in L.A., we're the tip of the iceberg, but there are a billion actors out there working in regional theaters, working amateur. It doesn't make any difference. It, it, it's, it, it's a fascinating, amazing, wonderful thing to be able to be an actor and pretend and so here it is. These are the guys. I, I worship some of these guys that are on this site. Um, I think they do. Sometimes I can't believe the work they're doing. The, my, one, my one regret is that you know, Phil was going to do one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. we didn't get to do that. Yeah. Because Phil was the epitome of what a character actor can be. Yeah. And, the, and the amount of concentration that can be brought to bear. And his work was example of that i mean just did amazing stuff but there's always new people coming who are doing amazing stuff too and some of them are on this site and uh you see new guys all the time coming up and doing just crazy stuff and and, and i think what you've got here you know when, when we sort of move move outside of the acting community a little bit um is a chance to watch these people again like you see i mean you said it before but to watch them perform in, in in its purest form to to watch them just just do their thing to be able to j just focus on an actor acting yeah and 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 i mean one of the things that, that triggered this was that uh and this may not be apparent to everybody mm -hmm. but there are many many you know theater programs all over the u.s and a lot of young actors do these monologues in their training yeah. i can't tell you how many waiters i've had over the years come up to me and tell <laughs> me that they did one of my monologues when they were in school or for auditions or whatever so this is an opportunity for those actors or anybody who's do, who's done one of these to say oh here's you know here's you know david zayas doing this guy and i did this guy yeah. so that's how he does it um so yeah. You, 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 you know, you, you, you don't need any, any more compliments, but I, I will say that I just uh, had uh, John Legg was on the show and he, he mentioned you. Oh, John. One of his, Johnny Legs. It's one, one of the Amazing. people who showed him that, that he could do that. Yeah, so. well, he was, I remember his first shows. They were incredible. We, we all came up through this crazy place, American Place Theater, and we did our first solo shows there. He was there. I was there. Bill Irm, Irwin was mm. there. Mm -hmm. um, oh, man. Dale Orlander Smith was there. A lot of. Um, they were very supportive of that kind of stuff then. Yeah, John's incredible. Yeah. He's a fireball. True fireball. There you go. That was Eric Bogosian. Not an easy interview, but a, a fascinating one nonetheless. Um, I will take the heat for that one. We uh, we actually recorded this several months ago. This this happened during the, the summer months. Uh, we, we were holding off, waiting to time it for the release of the Kickstarter project for 100 Monologues, which is uh, live right now. You can go to uh, 100monologues.com or you can... Uh, eh. Just do a, do a Google search for it and find it over on Kickstarter. Um, I was under the impression that we were going to, at least in part, be speaking about his uh, his recent book, Operation Nemesis, uh, which is about the Armenian Genocide. I was ready to, to talk about that, and he very much wanted to 
talk about the 100 monologues project um so <laughs> after some back and forth about you know whether uh um whether he ultimately wanted to have the conversation in spite of the fact that I wasn't super well versed in this specific project. Uh, sat down and he showed me a couple of them and then, then we sat down and actually sort of discussed the project. And I had a completely fascinating conversation. This is clearly something that he's incredibly passionate about. It's very much a, a labor of love. Um, you know, I was, I was honestly a bit surprised when I heard that he had something happening on on, on Kickstarter. Obviously, he's a very uh, well respected uh, playwright and 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 actor and and very very well recognized figure. And um, but uh, he he took to the crowdfunding campaign because he's putting out these uh, short videos of 100 different prominent actors recording these monologues that he wrote some time ago. So it's uh, really interesting, very fascinating, certainly worth checking out. Um, you know, go to the site, check out the project, and if you like what you see, go uh, fund it on Kickstarter. Basically, they've recorded about half of them at this point, so 50 have been filmed, and they need to, to put the money together to get the, the other 50 out there. Um, you know, it's relatively low overhead as far as these things are, are concerned um, but you know actually like getting these well-known actors and, and directors and things like that involved is, uh, is cost some money so uh, go check that out uh, thanks to uh, Jeff Newell for setting up that conversation and obviously thanks to uh, to, um, to Mr. Bogosian for, for taking the time to, to do that really really fascinating conversation I uh, enjoyed it very much uh, if you liked what you heard please rate us over at I iTunes. Um, you can uh, uh, follow us on Tumblr. That's riylcast.tumblr.com. That is the first and best place to get all of your riyl related information. If you've got any feedback, it's riylcast at gmail.com. Uh, like us on Facebook. Thanks, uh, thanks to Brian as always for editing the show together. Thanks to everybody at the Boing Boing Podcast Network. Many other fine podcasts to check out over at boingboing.net. That's about all I got for this week, so uh, stick around. We will be back just about this time next week with another episode of RIYL. Mm-hmm.